I... It's very nice to see all of you. Thank you for being here. Um, so when I was 20 and I was a junior at Kenyon College uh, in Gambier, Ohio, there's one person who can thank you or yeah, thanks. That's nice. Um, I uh, met a freshman who was brilliant and very deeply strange. One of the most genuinely beautiful, kind, generous, and peculiar people I have ever known. Uh, and it is my great pleasure uh, today, almost half our lives later, to still be his friend and to be able to welcome him uh, on stage t today here at VidCon. Ladies and gentlemen, Ransom Riggs. Hey! That was probably the nicest introduction I've ever received. Thank you. I don't remember you ever saying anything that nice to me in college. Ransom, I'm going to level with you. My fly is down. I have fixed that problem. <coughs> good. Let's take Thanks care for of coming to our party. First things first. Uh, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Let's, let's go totally off script from second one. Yeah, it's really weird kids? for us to be doing this in public because we enjoy doing it in private so much, but we've never actually done it this way. Um, you have a fascinating life, and I don't know how much of it we can get into or you want to get into. I probably should have asked you backstage. But I wonder if we can begin by talking about the inspiration for Miss Per for Miss Peregrine, uh, where the story began for you. Because I went to Ransom's apartment once, like after a few years after college, and he was like, "I would like to show you something." And I was like, "Cool," because he always has weird stuff. And he was like, "Here's my collection of 10,000 photographs that I found, and I bought at flea markets and stuff." And I was like, "This is." legitimately the weirdest thing that you've ever shown me, and that's really saying something. So where did the story begin for you? Uh, well, it really, I think it's easiest to talk about the photographs because they're the thing about the, the books that's most obviously unique. But for me, I feel like my true inspiration for the story was uh, growing up in suburban Florida, which is maybe something you can relate to. But I, I feel like I, I grew up feeling like a, like a I was in this oppressively normal place, uh, sort of dreaming of a you know, magical escape somehow, and reading tons of you know, the Chronicles of Narnia and Stephen King and any kind of fantasy stuff I could get a hold of. And ever since I was a young kid, I've been writing and trying to tell stories about discovering hidden worlds within our own that are accessible from within our own. Because I always loved the wish fulfillment idea that you could turn over the right rock or go to the right place or say the magic words and the door would open and you would be somewhere amazing. Um, so I had been trying to tell that story in various forms and ways from the time I was like nine years old and got a legal pad and just filled it up. Um, and when I started collecting photos, because I went to film school and I've always been obsessed with images and photography and the history of photography, started collecting these old pictures, um, they sort of unlocked something. I was drawn toward the strange ones because I'm strange, I guess. And um, I started wondering, who are these kids? Because when, I, when you find old pictures, I don't know if you guys have ever spent a, a whole Saturday at a flea market looking through old snapshots. Probably not. Um, yeah, no, they have. They are. <laughs> that was a joke. I'm very dry. It's extremely. <laughs> they are, they're totally divorced from any context. You know, they're just, it's an old picture. It's not from your grandfather's album or anything. It's just a bunch of old pictures that are unsorted. So you don't know who the people are. You don't know where they came from. You don't know their stories. And if you're like me, you start inventing them because no one's ever going to tell you. They're just completely, you know, a, afloat in the universe. And you, you find an interesting picture of a, of a kid with, you know, a funny hat, and you're like, where did he get that hat? And what's the deal with that? And where did he come from? And you almost feel bad for the kid that he's got no story, so you're doing him a favor by inventing one. So I had these photographs, and when I, you know, when I hit upon this idea of, of uh, using them to tell a story, to illustrate a, a novel, I, I already knew what kind of book I wanted it to be. It was a, let's just, let's, you know, give that kid in Florida a, a, a gift, a, a wish fulfillment escape, and um, 
he'll go and meet these kids. Obviously, they live in the hidden world. And, and the, he meets kids who are um, like him in, in like deep ways, not just in the superficial, uh, you know, sort of like literal ways of, of having these, these, you know, powers or talents or, but what, is there, a, was there a, a synonymous experience for you or did it in the end come from the fact that you didn't get that? Like I didn't get that um, when, I was, when I was in like middle school and I can't write about middle school because I like can't go back to that it's kid. Too painful. I can't it's let too myself think about that kid. It hurts me too much. It 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 becomes. I I get too interested in trying to save that kid instead of trying to tell a true story about them. Um, was it for you like a way of almost like going back into the past and 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 saving that kid, or did you have an experience like that of of being, you know, of of turning over a metaphorical rock and finding yourself in a different life. Because the life that you ended up with is vastly different from the life that most of the kids in your high school had. Like just, not just because you're an author, but I mean, living in Los Angeles, going to college in Ohio, like you had a very, you went on a, a weird path from the beginning. Yeah, there was an experience I had like that. It wouldn't have made a very good fantasy novel, but, um when I was in high school, uh, my guidance counselor um, recommended this camp to me. I'd been to some summer camps before and they were all universally horrible, like uh, in the middle of the woods, like it was a horseback riding camp and I thought, we're gonna ride horses, but we were just shoveling their, their poo the whole summer and it was very hot and I touched an electric fence accidentally. <laughs> so I don't have great memories of that, um, but yeah, I went to this, this camp in, at the University of Virginia for young writers, and I had never been surrounded by so many people who I felt like I had a kinship and a bond with. We all wanted to do these things with our lives that we weren't sure was possible. I didn't know it was a real thing you could actually do for a career to go and write books for a living and, and somehow support yourself doing that. And so I found my tribe in a certain way, and it was a very powerful experience, and I went back three summers in a row, and it changed my life. It was only two weeks each summer, but it felt like this really outsized, momentous uh, thing in my life. So this is kind of like that, you know, this is Jacob doing that, except instead of going to a camp in Virginia, he's going to a, you know, island off the coast of Wales where there's a time loop and a girl <laughs> with a mouth in the back of her head and a, et cetera. Speaking of which, uh, I think this would be a good time. So a brand, a new trailer for Miss Peregrine just uh, came out on Monday. Um, it's really, cool. I'm a little biased, but I think I'm also objectively correct. You might, uh, have, you might have seen this before, but you've never seen it this large. You've never and seen it on this I. big of a screen. So we're going to show the new trailer for Miss Peregrine. Awesome. Can I turn around and watch? Yeah, that's fine. Follow me. There's something I need to show you. But you have to promise not to run away. There's a new would you mind tying that rope around my waist? And it's just around the bend. Promise to hold on tight. There's a new world coming. Wait, what's happening? This one's coming to Come meet the others. There's a brand new morning. Jake, right on time. Miss Peregrine, delighted to meet you. Invisible. Of course. We're what's known in common parlance as peculiar. It's a recessive gene carrying down through families. Air. It's my peculiarity. Because our abilities don't fit in the outside world, we live in places like this. To keep us safe, we create a time loop. A loop preserves the last 24 hours. Set the loop, and you can stay here forever. I knew you were one of us when you were born. It's time for you to learn what you can do. I'm just ordinary. No, you're not. You were born to protect us. From what? We call them hollows. For centuries, they've hunted us for our powers. I assure you, we are coming.
changes everything. Promise me one thing, Jake. That you will look after them all. I promise. There's a new world coming. My dad said that everything had already been discovered. Not everything, Jake. There's a place I go when I want to be alone. How did you? It's my peculiarity. If I show you the rest, you have to promise not to run away. I like Ranson's book. I like the fact that he made a story out of these old photographs. I just felt very compelling and mysterious. He's invisible. Of course. We're what's known in common parlance as peculiar. When I heard that Tim Burton was going to make the film, I was like, what? This is insane. I play Miss Peregrine. She runs the home of the peculiar children. They go into hiding because they're hunted. Their own lives are threatened, and they have to find a way out of these situations by using these peculiarities. Because our abilities don't fit in the outside world, we live in places like this. Everything really comes together as a Tim Burton film. His enthusiasm on set is infectious. I assure you, we are coming. Great directors have a vision, and that's what actors love. There's something that's quite poetic and beautiful about this whole world. It's refreshing that a movie says, embrace your uniqueness, don't be ashamed of it. I knew you were one of us when you were born. It's time for you to learn what you can do. So I, can't, cool. I can't get enough of that. I could watch that every, every day. It's so cool. In fact, I do. <laughs> Tell me, uh, can you, you've seen the movie, right? I, we, I saw it yesterday. Can you t tell me about your experience of watching it or, or not? Well, so yesterday was the second time I'd seen the movie, and the first time was like a month ago, and uh, I hardly remember that experience because it was so sort of overwhelming and surreal and emotional to see, you know, first of all, your own... I, we visited the set, my, Tata and my wife and I, we visited the set a few times while the movie was being made, so I had some preconceived notion of what certain things might look like, but I was not ready to see an epic two-hour film of, like, great vision and, uh, you know, incredible craftsmanship uh, that's made of words that I wrote alone in my bedroom. Like yeah, that is ago, weird. so crazy. It's so hard to get your head around that, that like all these people who are wildly talented have taken these w words that you wrote in complete isolation and turned them into this massive collaborative collaboration that's far more beautiful than anything that you could have made yourself. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, at least that was how I felt like when I watched, uh, I mean, the first, the first time I watched a movie adaptation of my book, I, w I was alone with Sarah, like, on the Fox lot. Were you on the Fox lot? Yeah. And were you alone? Uh, no, I was with Tahara. But I were... mean, I was alone with my wife. Right. I, that's what I consider alone. <laughs> we were alone. Yeah. Right. There's no other people there, though. And there's something so magical about being with, like, your life partner and, and, and seeing this thing for the first time there's, I, at least for me, like, there's no feeling like it. Like, it's one of the best memories of my life. Like, at the end of the movie, I looked over at Sarah, and she was crying, and she never cries. She's cried, like, five times in our whole marriage. And I cried five times today. I cried during the Miss Peregrine trailer, because <laughs> I was so proud of my friend Ransom. Um, oh. And she was crying, and I was like, it's good, right? And she was like, I don't know if it's good, but it's definitely sad. <laughs> <laughs> we, um... I, I, before we went in, uh, I was like, I'm not going to cry. And Tahada was like, I'm not going to cry. And then we both totally cried at some point during the movie. And then afterward, we just looked at each other. You know, the, it's very abrupt. There's no credit sequence at the end of these you know, cuts that they show you at, on, the, on the lot. So the last shot 
closes and it's just like, boom, it's over, lights up, and you're like, <gasps> what happened? And we just looked at each other and we knew instinctively that we shouldn't talk about it. We left the theater in silence. We got into our car, we drove 10 minutes to a coffee shop. We sat down, we ordered coffee, we waited for it to come, and then we talked about it because we had so much to say and I didn't want to talk about it in the parking lot, but it was just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, and it was, you know. It's also a massive <sighs> sense of relief, uh, at least in yes. my case, <laughs> because, you know, you don't make the movie, so you don't know if it's going to be good. Right. Uh, and yeah, you just have to hope for the best. We were talking about this earlier. I, I, I sort of compared it to like an arranged marriage, you know, where you, you know a little about the movie as it's going along. Maybe you read the script. Maybe you saw some of the scenes being shot. But you, you get this package, and it's like, well, you better like it. And thank God, I love it. It's, you know, That's great. Can you tell me about uh, what it was like to be on set? It was very, very surreal, um, especially because they shot this movie in, in, in sequence of, uh, of how the script is written, which is really unusual because it's a big pain in the ass uh, for the crew and the actors to schedule everything to shoot. The first scene in the script gets shot first. It's very unusual. So, uh, of course, That the is book, super unusual. Especially for a movie of this scope and expense. And so the, the movie, like the book, starts out in Florida. Jacob's at, ho at home in Florida with his parents, living his very ordinary life when, you know, something awful happens to his grandfather and he has this. So the first set we visited was in this uh, little suburban cul-de-sac outside of Tampa. Uh, and it just, it looked like the street I grew up on. And it looked like, I went to film school and it looked like a film school shoot almost. It was just like they had, occupied one of the houses and there were some people standing around and some apple boxes and equipment and I'm sort of like, this is it? And then Tim Burton walks by, you know, and his dark glasses and his wild hair and I was like, oh, oh my God, okay, this is real, this is crazy. And I'm a big film nerd, so I know a lot of the people who were working on the movie, Colleen Atwood, the triple Oscar winning costume designer and Bruno, Bruno Del Bono, who's the cinematographer and shot Amelie in a million beautiful movies. And so I was just geeking out the whole time, not to mention, you know, Terrence Stamp and Judy Dench and Asa and all of these amazing actors who were in the movie. So I was just sort of humbled that I could even be there. And they were so kind. I gotta say, the, the thing about a Tim Burton set, and I've been on a lot of really low budget sets, and there's usually a lot of sort of like egos and jockeying and sort of like, you know, tensions bubbling below the surface and people who are mad at each other. And uh, Tim's worked with many of the same people for years and it just felt like a family. It really felt like everyone was super excited to be there and on the same team and just trying to make the best thing they could every day and it was really cool. It was such a positive experience. That's great. So I wanna ask you um, about the book. So this book is called Tales of the Peculiar. It comes out September 3rd. I'm very excited uh, about it because unlike you, I have read it. Uh, and it is really awesome and, and weird and cool, and it's a really cool reading experience. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about the book. You read it? When did you read it? I got, the, your, your editor sent me a galley, because she's also You're my sneaky. editor. Wow. I am a pretty, I'm a sneaky guy. I got uh, it like two days ago. I read it on the plane. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Thank you. Thanks for I'm writing flattered. it, man. It was so fun to read. I am flattered. Um, so the, the, of course, there is the Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, the book that the movie is based on. But there are also two sequels, Hollow City and Library of Souls, and they form sort of an arc. Um, when I was done writing that, uh, I felt like I wasn't finished. And there is, in Hollow City and Library of Souls, is a very important object uh, in the books that the kids use over and over again to help them out of sticky situations. And it's called Tales of the Peculiar. It's a huge... Uh, old leather-bound compilation of fairy tales set in the peculiar world. It's like fairy tale. It's like the Brothers Grimm for peculiar children. They all grow up loving these stories and they know them by heart. Um, and I wrote a couple of them in the second book because they, you know, the, the house gets destroyed and they escape the island and they don't have. They they fill a rowboat with things. But one of the things they bring with them is this huge book. Um, and it really helps them out of some situations. And so they read the stories and I had so much fun writing them that I was like, I wanna do, I wanna do more of this. I wanna write more. So once I had finished the three books, I, uh, I got to play and have fun and write this book of uh, fairy tales set in the peculiar world. And it was the most fun I've had writing in ever. <laughs>
Speaking of uh, how much fun you have writing, so something that you may not know is that Ransom and I were in a sketch comedy group uh, together in college. Um, we were extremely funny to us, and, and, and I remember shortly after Sarah and I got married, we were hanging out with Ransom, and he had all these old VHS tapes of uh, our uh, comedy troupe, and we showed them to Sarah, and Ransom and I were just laughing uproariously the whole time, like, can you believe how brilliant we were? And Sarah, at the end, she was like, guys, that was not good. <laughs> And if you listen to the tape, which John's dad filmed all of the performances, you don't hear a lot of people laughing. In you the don't audience. hear a lot of laughter. No, it's that never mostly us in. the the main thing. The main laughter that happens is when I break and start laughing because I found Ransom to be so funny. I, he's just, in my opinion, a comic genius. In the opinion of the world, more complicated. We would, perhaps. We would end every show with like a seven-minute musical number. Yes, we did it. We did a musical number. Did that in sync song. What was the song? I oh can't. no, we wrote this, oh right, we Stephen wrote Wonder this song. weird musical about being stranded on a desert island with only the members of the comedy troupe. God, it was so funny, but nobody liked it but us. It um, was really ahead of its time, I'll just say that. So I've been reading your writing, and between that and the fact that we took uh, this uh, Ulysses course together, I've been reading your writing uh, for almost 20 years now. Uh, I wonder if you can talk about your uh, your journey as as a writer, because there was film school along the way. You had, and I want to talk about this too, your amazing YouTube channel, now quasi-abandoned, unfortunately. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for him, you to restart your YouTube we'll career. But um, I wonder if you can talk about, you know, where, how you get from, how you got from writing, in my opinion, very funny sketches for our college comedy troupe to uh, Miss Peregrine. Well, uh, I feel like be being a novelist was a dream I nurtured as a child and then sort of abandoned. From age like 12 to age like 8 to 16, it's all I wanted to do. I wrote novellas longhand in these big legal pads and I joined a writing group at the local uh, Englewood, Florida Public Library, which was all retirees and me at age 12 writing like Stephen King, you know, like limbless man in a box when they were just like, who is this kid? I, I, we might have to call someone about, you know, he's not well. Um, and then I, I sort of went off the rails after uh, I saw The Shining. I was like, this is an amazing film. Someone is responsible for making this. And that's, I never realized that can be your job. You can make, you know, films for a job and tell the camera where to go and all of this stuff. So I became obsessed with movies. I was still writing, but I just, you know, I got like, my friend had an old broken video camera and we just spend every weekend making making movies in the in the backyard, and uh, so you know YouTube people. This is before the era of nonlinear editing, and uh, you know we we didn't know how to put the footage together after we'd shot it. So you had to shoot in sequence, and when the shot was over, you pressed you know end record, and then you shot the next thing. And if you didn't do it right, you you just had to redo the whole thing. Anyway, so. I went to school, I went to Kenyon College with you, I took a writing class from P.F. Kaluge, and I still was not, I loved writing, but I, I feel like I had never clicked into exactly what I wanted to do. I had never enjoyed writing as much as I did when I was 13, and writing these sort of Chronicles of Narnia cross with Stephen King cross with Monty Python stories since then, and I always felt like I was, I was trying to conform to someone else's idea of what a good story was or what, you know, the professors at Kenyon would think was a great story. So I was sort of trying to write, I don't know, realistic fiction about a kid growing up in Florida or some, you know, intense thing happening or stuff that wasn't really in my wheelhouse, I think. And it wasn't until after I went to film school and I hadn't written a word of fiction in like five years that um, the opportunity to write a novel came along and I was like, okay. I'll give it a shot. You know, someone's willing to pay me a minuscule amount of money and I don't have anything else going on, so I'm going to give it a try. And I went back to the stories I loved when I was 12 and it just flowed. It felt so natural and so joyful that I just tapped into something that was there all along and I had been ignoring. Yeah, I remember it. We, we, we weren't in the same class, uh, in the same creative writing class, but we had the same creative writing professor and I didn't get into the advanced fiction writing class, um, which was, 
it was a bummer. I'm glad some of you find it funny. At the time, it wasn't that funny to me. Um, uh, so I didn't get in. There were like 15 applicants, and there were 12 spots, and I was in that, that bottom three. I'm pretty sure that professor gets shit about this on a daily basis. He actually apologized to me recently. Um, <laughs> And I went, I, but then, to be fair, I went back and I read my submission, and it was not promising. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I can see his perspective. So anyway, um, after that happened, I was, I was really devastated, and this, this writing professor invited me over to his house, and he said, look, you know, I would have let you into the class, but I think one of the reasons you didn't get in is because you're trying to sound like a writer. You're writing the way that you think writers write, if you could just write the way that you tell stories during breaks, you would be much better. And that was a really clarifying moment for me when I, I, writing didn't have to be a chore, it didn't have to be uh, something that was sort of willfully um, ob obscure, <laughs> like it, that it could be joy. Um, and since then, I have tried to pursue that feeling of joy. We all have, all writers, I think, have that moment where you click in and it's just, there is nothing like it. Uh, and then there are long periods where you don't have that feeling and right. you chase it and you chase it and you chase it and then when it comes back, it's just pure. It's the purest thing I've ever felt. It's the, it, it, there, it, it, it doesn't have any strains of anything else for me. It's pure joy. Um, but I want to talk to you about your failed YouTube career. So I'm still very angry about this. So here's my understanding of the situation, and correct me insofar as I am wrong about this. Your first big hit on YouTube was uploading a video that you shot when we were in college of me describing my high school senior prank. Correct. A video I desperately still wish that would be taken off of the internet. <laughs> it is deeply humiliating. Don't look this up. I think I finally, I think I finally took it down. Did you? Yes, but I'm sure a lot of other people have uploaded I just, it. First off, so I'm sure you thank can still you find for it. taking it down. That was the most generous thing that you've done in the history of our friendship. So when we, when we were in You could have just asked me. I would have done it years ago. I know, but I didn't want to ask. It seemed rude. Um, when we, I mean, I did say those things in that order, so I should suffer the punishment. Um, <laughs> when we were in college, Ransom was r a really passionate filmmaker, and he was the only person I knew who even like had a video camera or knew how to use one. Uh, and one of the things that he did was he asked basically a wide variety of people to talk about their high school experiences. I actually lived with my parents for a summer and uh, worked with my dad, who's a documentary filmmaker, uh, and. I, I thought the, the videos that he was making back then were absolutely beautiful, but of course there was no YouTube, there was no way to share so these sort of short format things, but he had a magical way of getting you to tell a story better than you'd ever told it, even though the camera was on. And, um, and then you went on to make these weird and beautiful small documentaries. I keep saying weird. That's just, let's, let's just assume that everything he does is a little weird. Um, or, I'm sorry, I have to be on brand. Hashtag peculiar. Hashtag stay peculiar. Hashtag stay peculiar. That is a good hashtag, actually. Um, uh, so he stayed peculiar. Um, and you made these weird uh, video documentaries of going into abandoned spaces. You and I both have done some urban exploring in our day. Um, and you would go into these abandoned uh, places and talk about them and how they made you feel. And it was all voiceover but it was very beautiful and far ahead of its time. You also made one about this uh, place in California. What's it called? The Salton Sea. Yeah, this like weird abandoned, uh, dried up lake. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about your experiences with YouTube and why you ch didn't choose to keep making those videos. It's funny, I went to, so I went to USC film school um, and I, I, I feel like I had the same experience making films and videos as I did with writing, where I spent a lot of time and years trying to make films and write in a way that I thought I was supposed to. I, I, you know, you, you start out writing in a way, you, 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 you're, you're, you're like, I think this is how it's supposed to sound, but that's not your voice. And that's what I did all through film school, is I made all these short films, and I was just learning, but I spent an inordinate amount of time making this thesis film about a, a boy who thinks he's an alien, and 
it was trying to be like Steven Spielberg, this Amblin-y thing, and it was not me. It wasn't, I hadn't tapped into whatever my voice was, and so it felt forced, and it didn't really work, and I, I left school feeling a little befuddled, and I'm like, well, maybe I'm not really that good at this. And it was only after I started writing books, and I stopped caring quite so much about making films, and I stopped pushing so hard, and waking up every day being like the only future I can see for myself is as a writer, director of films, that I was able to sort of relax and something in my brain unlocked. And uh, I just said, I, you know, I, I loved exploring the desert. I love the desert in California. I love exploring the desert. I love sort of abandoned places. And I, I said, well, I'm just going to take my camera out there and shoot stuff and see what I find and make something. You know, it doesn't have to have a point. It, there's no crew. There's no camera. It's not fancy. Um, and it turned out to be one of the best things I'd ever made. And it was simple, it cost nothing, um, and people really liked it. Will you do more of that in the future, maybe? Yeah, probably, maybe. But here's the problem, is they take forever. They take so long for me to make because I'm a perfectionist and I'm really slow. I recommend just making a video every Tuesday. <laughs> It's not, I, I, it's not it was, that hard. It was so amazing when you started doing the YouTube stuff because I was sort of like, John, your videos don't look very professional. As someone who went to USC film school, let me tell you how it's done. You need all of this stuff and lights and all these, you know, and then you need the special color correcting software. And you're like, no, nah, I'm just going to shoot my, put it up in the, and now he's like the most famous. I was like, I'm just gonna, I think I'll just put my face in it and then I'll have my face move around the frame. And I think that'll be it. I think that's my special effect, is my yeah. quick moving face. Pretty much. <laughs> and here we are 10 years later, and that is still essentially my only special effect. I think my problem is I'm not good at this. I'm not good at the talking to the camera. I, don't, I actually don't agree with that, but this, that's probably a fight that we should have uh, off, off stage. We'll do this later, yeah. <laughs> But I know, I, I mean, I think the work that, that you've done is amazing. I thought, I thought that documentary and the, I mean, they're much more like films than they are like YouTube videos of, of my imagination, you know. Um, but I thought both, uh, and then the one that you made in Belgium was just gripping. Uh, I wonder why is it because we grew up in Florida in these half abandoned places? Is that why we are both kind of congenitally obsessed? with abandonment and ruin and ruined places and, and I mean even unto like I am an anxious, cautious person and I will go into like an abandoned hospital full of asbestos with ransom because it feels exciting and cool and I will not, I won't go on, I won't stand, I can't stand on top of this table man. Uh, so why is it that we're, why is it that we have both ended up obsessed with that stuff? It might be, part of it might be growing, growing up in America where everything is new and you're just interested in old things, but I feel like Florida is in many ways a sort of experiment that succeeded and failed. And it's so new, nothing's more than 50 or 60 years old, that, you know, that you can see these experiments sort of laid down in the jungle and the ones that failed are still there, and it's fascinating. You wonder why, what happened? There's a suburb, maybe 10 miles from where I grew up, where they plotted out all the streets, they gridded them, they paved them, they put road signs in, and then they never built a single house, and it's still there, sort of returning to seed, and... It was used, uh, it was used by drug planes as a runway. That's right. It's in crazy. The, in the 80s, like the, you know, the They the, would, dry, the they would fly would in a plane with cocaine, onto this street in this abandoned, half-built suburb. So I guess in some ways I'm, I've always been interested in like the study of human failure, and abandonment represents that. And I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm an excessively morbid person. I don't, you know, I'm not like obsessed with death or anything. You might be surprised, but I'm not. But this is sort of a version of like, well, what happens if we, if we don't get it right, you know? It's like, why do people watch horror movies? You're sort of exorcising a worst case scenario or something. I remember once in college, uh, we were like all writing a sketch and someone was like, Ransom, you're a dark dude. And he was like, uh, I don't really think of it as darkness. I just think of it as the, the world correctly apprised. <laughs> Do you remember that? I always sound better when quoted by you. <laughs> You're like, I just think that's the correct, I'm just being realistic. I guess, I don't remember that. Okay, well it uh, did, maybe it didn't happen. It's funny, a lot of, uh, I think people expect me to be weirder than I am. 
And I then mean, meet me, and they're kind of disappointed. They're like, you seem so normal. And I'm like, yeah, the weird thing about me is that I collect old photos of children. That is just... That's it. It's right there on the surface. That is just not the only weird thing about you. Like, I mean, <laughs> I feel like I know you fairly well after all these years, and like... You are one of, and I mean this, and I think you will take it as a compliment, I mean this as the highest possible compliment, like one of the few genuinely, truly eccentric people I have ever met. Really? Yes. It feels so normal, like on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, I'm sure inside of your head, all of it feels very regular. <laughs> Maybe it's because I live in Los Angeles, and so there's that's so true, much weirdness. That's true. If I lived in Los Angeles, I might know more eccentric you people, I guess. walk down Venice Beach, and you feel like the most normal person in the world. So uh, before we uh, get to, we have a pretty cool, we have a, we have a bit of a cool video surprise for you, but um, before we get to that, I wanted to go back to one last uh, thing uh, from our past, which is that Ransom and I uh, took this trip to the Grand Canyon uh, when we were in college. It was very poorly planned. I think it was only scheduled a few days in advance. As this I was a famous John Green road trip where I th you approached me in the middle of campus one day we were just on our way. We weren't even walking together. You just sort of stopped me and you were like, road trip, Grand Canyon, Tuesday. And I was like, okay. That's how he lived his life then and now. I did go on a lot of ill-advised road trips. <laughs> Most of them worked out terribly. Uh, the one that I went on to Alaska was just an epic failure on every level and resulted in me losing my only and beloved toaster oven, but that is a different story. When you told me you'd written a book called Looking for Alaska, I assumed for a long time that that's what it was about. Going to Alaska with that girl and her stealing my toaster oven? Yeah. I was like, that doesn't sound great, but I'll read it since you're my friend. I mean, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but when we got back to campus at the end of the summer, and I'd asked her to bring my toaster oven back from Alaska to college. And I went to her apartment, which wasn't a lot of fun. You know, I wasn't excited to see her or anything. And I was like, do you have my toaster oven? And she said, I'm sorry, I left it on the side of the road in Soldotna, Alaska to make room for my new boyfriend's stuff. Uh, <laughs> it was darkness. Just <laughs> darkness descended. I'm sorry, what were we talking about? The Grand Canyon? Right. We went on, we went on an, a, quick, a poorly planned and ill-advised road trip that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a magical time in my life. I have a lot of memories from that uh, journey to and from the Grand Canyon. It's actually the only time I've seen the kind of the American Southwest that way. Um, the deserts, the openness. Um, and I wonder if there is a, if there are trips in your life or moments from your life that you drew on when writing Miss Peregrine and then saw like inverted or you know reimagined in beautiful and strange and weird and cool ways when you were watching the movie. Yeah, actually, um, I, I worked as much of my weird personal experiences into that book as I, as I could, and many of them are like kind of hidden and buried and it's not totally obvious except for the part about the kid growing up in a boring town in Florida, which is obviously my experience. Um, but there, I, I, I took up scuba diving about eight years ago, and I went on a trip to Vanuatu, which is a tiny, tiny sort of arch archipelago island nation in the South Pacific. And my friend and I went on some amazing night dives in an old sunken luxury liner that had sunk in like 1942. See, that's weird. Hitting like, that's an example of a thing that you do that's a weird thing. Well, it's just like going to the abandoned hospital with the asbestos except underwater, which was so much better. Right, but I also wouldn't do that except that I'm with you <laughs> doing the weird stuff that you do. Well, it was amazing. This, yeah. that we, were, we got to explore this huge luxury liner that had sunk in, in shallow water with everything aboard. It had like old Jeeps and medical equipment and everyone survived, so it wasn't that morbid, but all this stuff from the 1940s was still in the boat. And we went down, we dived it a bunch during the day, but then we did a night dive, which was a really special thing because we got to go, it was pitch black, we had flashlights, we dove down the side of the ship and then went into the cargo hold where not even moonlight was penetrating. We turned off our flashlights. We were with a dive guide, it would have been suicidal otherwise. And we, we waited there for about seven minutes just breathing in the complete darkness and then very slowly these bioluminescent fish sort of forgot we were there and started to light up all around us and it was like being in outer space it was the most sort of amazing humbling you know beautiful sight i've ever witnessed and i thought when i was writing this book i have to put some shipwrecks in there and they have to go into the shipwrecks 
And as you can see from the, um, from the trailer, Tim took the kids go into the shipwreck thing and, and like times 1,000 did it. So they, they raised the ship. It's the most astounding sequence I've ever seen like committed to film. And I just, I'm watching it with my mouth agape being like, that was because of a vacation I went on. That's insane. So life is weird. That's the takeaway from today, I think. Life is weird. Life is weird. I'm, yeah, maybe I'm it's not that. Lucky. Maybe it's not that you're weird. It's that life itself is very deeply weird. I I'm mean, just correctly apprising it. If you could have, oh yeah. <laughs> if you could have, uh, if you could go back in time, I think, and, and tell uh, 18 and 20 year old us that, that this this was in the future, I think they would have been duly surprised. Highly dubious. Um, I want to. Uh, Thank you all for being here, but we have uh, a, a thing that we want to um, show you. So uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking um, about our peculiarities and Ransom's possible weirdness. Um, we've got a lot of peculiar YouTube creators out there too, so exclusively uh, for folks here at VidCon, um, some peculiar uh, online video creators have worked up something pretty special. Um, you might see some faces you recognize, so we're going to see the video now. galaxy, a planet, a city where I've said, a tale of people with gifts and mystique, this tale of people both odd and unique. There was once a girl with enchanted vision, who'd look into your soul with ardent precision, with all sorts of people, she could connect by using her words to amazing effect. An audience of millions would listen for advice on topics of love and of art and of life. There once was a girl who, just like a bird, could perfectly sing any song that she heard. She'd gather the sounds and the tones and the cues and craft them into a song that's brand new. entertain and delight and people would listen to them all through the night there once was a girl who was strange and unmoving the people around her looked on disapproving they said get a job get moving get a life but the girl didn't listen she just smiled polite in the city of millions only one was glancing she wasn't frozen in time she was simply dancing Once was a witch with magical powers who could transform her features in minutes, not hours. People would meet her and hesitantly inquire if she was okay because her face was a fire. But it wasn't dark magic that allowed her these deeds. The illusion all came from her powders and creams. I celebrate the oddballs and the unfamiliar. They're not flawed at all, they're just peculiar. Go challenge yourself. Don't settle for normal. Find your voice and your passion, your mind as a portal to a peculiar galaxy that's all your own. And this world is here waiting for your world to be shown. Thanks to uh, Andrea Russett, Jody Steele, Andy Case, and Megan Batoon for being in that cool video. That's going to be uh, online uh, like immediately after this, uh, so share it. Use that hashtag. Uh, we've got to stay on brand with the hashtag, stay peculiar. Um, and uh, I want to say thank you uh, to Ransom for being here, um, and thanks to all of you for being here at VidCon, for caring about books just as you care about online video. Um, and. Uh, I too agree. 
I know that there is no way you guys are excited as I am uh, for the Miss Peregrine movie on September 30th. Um, I will be like first in line, but I hope that you are second and third in line behind me. Um, the movie comes out on September 30th. It's, uh, it's going to be really, really awesome. And uh, Ransom, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Really, this is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. Hey, do you have a phone? Yes. All right. We're if you don't mind, we're going to take a quick picture. Uh, two old friends with y'all. What do we have in the way of house lights? Anything? There we go. That's something. All right. All right. Make some, make some, make moves. Thank you guys, I don't think any of you showed up, but I appreciate you being here nonetheless. Thank you so much, and as we say in my hometown, don't forget to be awesome. Bye.